we are finishing up our momentum unit and I just wanted to touch briefly on uh, perfectly elastic collisions and conservation of momentum. Uh, as you know, a elastic collision is one in which both momentum and energy is conserved. Momentum is conserved because the objects are free to translate. Energy is conserved because none of the kinetic energy gets converted into heat or sound or any deformation, anything like that. Um, because both momentum and energy are conserved, we can set up our conservation of momentum and conservation of energy equations simultaneously. So before we go any further, just let me say that you will not be expected to perform this derivation on my test or the AP test. Um, this is just kind of here for your reference so you can get a better understanding of what's going on and how this works, how something can be um, perfectly elastic. So assuming I know my initial velocities, um, I have two equations and I have two unknowns. To make this a little easier, we're actually going to say that the initial velocity of one of the objects is zero. So there's a little algebra here. Like I said, it's really not important. Um, what's important is the end result. Um, so little algebra magic there. I have rearranged the equations this way because... The highlighted portion, it is the same on both, so I'm going to replace that highlighted portion on the right with m2 v2 prime. So the prime just means final for me. I prefer to use prime instead of like a subscript f because I think it makes things a little neater. I don't know. There's lots of subscripts and superscripts anyway. Um, so plugging that in, a little more algebra magic. I obviously recorded this in advance. <laughs> um, we come to this nifty little equation here, which does play in um, to what I'm going to show y'all on the next slide. But for now, um, looking at that V2 prime, you can see it over on the other side. So see there where I've highlighted. I'm now going to replace the left side with what's on the right side. Handy little color coding here. A little bit more magic, we are solving for V1 prime. So there is your final velocity of the first object in terms of the initial velocity of the first object. Okay, since our, uh, our second object started at rest, that's why there's no V2 initial term in there. Um, so there's V1 prime. We got to solve for V2 prime, so let me rearrange this, okay? Um, we're going to replace V1 prime, highlighted in pink. I'm just going to start over, essentially. And there, I've plugged it in. Lots of algebra magic. And, whew, those are the two results. Aren't you glad that I did it instead of making you do it? Like I said, you will never have to derive this. This is the very, very analytical math way of approaching it. Um, there's actually another way of approaching it that I think is more useful, so hopefully you stuck around this long. Go ahead and, and finish out this video. Um, so, like we said, momentum and energy are conserved, and the cool thing about, well, the universe and how it works, is that momentum and energy are going to be conserved in all reference frames. So remember, this is for elastic collisions, collisions where both momentum and energy are conserved. Uh, Newton's first law says, well, actually, that the momentum of a system will not change unless it's acted upon by an external force. So if the motion of the system, the momentum of the system won't change, that means the velocity of the system, or rather, the velocity of the system's center of mass, isn't going to change. And this is actually really useful, especially as we start getting into rotation here in a little bit. So here we have two hypothetical objects. I just kind of made up numbers. They work out okay, but that wasn't, it wasn't on purpose. Um, and these two objects are going to collide. So this method that I'm going to show you works when velocities are non-zero. So notice the second object is moving in this one, which is pretty cool. Um, the first step in this method is finding the velocity of the center of mass. Essentially, we're finding the velocity of the system as a whole. Um, you're essentially taking a weighted average. It's all of your momentums on top divided by the mass so that you'd have velocities left if you, if you think about how those units work out. So the velocity of the turquoise one is four, or, or sorry, the momentum of the turquoise one is four. The momentum of the orange one is negative three. Remember, direction is important. 
add those in the numerator, divide by the total mass. The velocity of our center of mass is uh, a quarter of a meter per second to the right. So essentially, if we were to zoom out and just kind of look at these two objects together, the whole thing would be moving to the right at a quarter of a meter per second. Uh, fun fact, if these two objects stick together, they're going to move off to the right with a speed of 0.25 meters per second. So that's another useful tool there. That, that velocity of the center of mass formula is essentially um, that perfectly inelastic collision formula. Anyway, so momentum is going to be conserved in all reference frames. If I take these two objects and I stick them in a box with wheels and I give the box a push, uh, negative one quarter of a meter per second, so that to me, outside of the box, the velocity of the center is zero, we can actually do a lot of cool things here. Um, so they're going to collide inside this box and to me, the entire system appears to have a velocity of zero. The individual ones still have speed relative to each other. Um, to calculate the speed at which they approach, or the speed at which um, the outside observer observes, this has to do with relative motion way, way back when. Um, in the outside reference frame, it's the velocity within the reference frame plus the velocity of the thing that's moving. Okay, you can review that um, later if, if you don't understand what I'm doing here. Um, so essentially to me, on the outside, it seems like the turquoise ball is moving at 3.75 meters per second and it seems like the orange one is moving to the left at uh, 1.25 meters per second. So remember earlier on the last slide, um, I set up two equations and I had two unknowns and I was able to solve for it. Well, it turns out there is only one solution to this problem. Um, the only way for both momentum and energy to be conserved is for the signs on the velocities to flip. So you can kind of imagine that. Um, the flipping of the signs on the velocities will make turquoise's velocity to the left. It'll make orange's velocity to, or momentum to the right. Um, and their energies are going to be the same because it's that velocity squared thing that really poses problems. But we've got the same velocities, same magnitude velocities, and when you square it, I mean, the negative sign goes away anyway. So just take my word for it. You flip the signs on the velocities, and that gives you your velocities after the collision. All right, we're not quite done yet because these are still um, the velocities to the outside observer. This, this system is still in the box. The box is still moving a quarter of a meter per second to the left. We want to take it out of the box. So to get rid of the box, while it was going a quarter of a meter per second to the left, we're going to add a quarter of a meter per second to both of those velocities. So when that happens, we actually do get, and you can confirm that energy and momentum are both conserved, we get that our um, V1 prime is negative 3.5, the turquoise ball after the collision goes to the left at 3.5 meters per second, and the orange ball goes to the right at 1.5 meters per second. So this is kind of um, a useful tool. It's kind of a shortcut, depending on how, how you want to look at it. Um, I think the most important aspect of this is that um, in any collision, the velocity of the center of mass won't change as long as there are no external forces acting. You know, so there's like no friction, they're not just going to like hit a wall and come to a stop. Um, so as long as there's no external force, using that velocity of the center of mass, it can help you figure out an inelastic collision really quick because they're going to move off with the same speed as the center of mass. Um, or in the case of the elastic collision, on the rare case um, that you'd ever be asked to calculate it from scratch, this is the faster method of doing it. Plus, you don't have to memorize any equations. So, all right, that's all I have to say about elastic collisions. Remember, you'll never have to derive the formulas on the front. So I hope that, that um, this idea of the center of mass has helped you uh, maybe see this in a new perspective.